Okay, it's 10.45, people are still trickling in, so I'm gonna give them about another minute. Everybody's here for the presentation on uh, how to migrate your Drupal 7 website to Sitecore, correct? Yeah. <laughs> you don't joke about things like that. <laughs> Okay, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're not talking about Sitecore today. Uh, we are talking about uh, how to scale uh, authenticated traffic in Drupal. We're using a case study based on wholefootsmarket.com, which is uh, where I'm from, uh, and a project that Adam's been working heavily on. And um, how we did that with stateless authentication. So I'm Dr. J. Uh, I'm the tech lead for Wholefoods Market. Uh, I work on the web teams mostly. Um, got some contact information up there if you guys have any questions or just want to connect with me afterwards. And this handsome fella here. <laughs> hey, my name is Adam Weingarten. Uh, I'm a technical architect with Acquia. Um, so I work at our professional services group. Um, so helping to, you know, um, come together with requirements, look at, um, you know, crazy client asks, um, and then try to, you know, pull a bunny out of my hat and, you know, make sure that uh, we pull it off and, uh, you know, keep our, all the things uh, working, running, and keeping our clients smiling. Uh, so uh, it's always uh, an interesting challenge. And uh, we, we are that crazy client. Um, so we uh, oh, brought to you by Acquia, which hearts Whole Foods. Um, so today we're gonna talk about um, uh, everything you see on the board here. Why scaling authenticated traffic is hard. Some of you may have already felt the pain on that. Um, We'll be talking about uh, what sessionless authentication is. Um, sometimes we'll call it stateless authentication, but they're the same thing. Um, we're gonna talk about how we used it at hopelessmarket.com to do a single login to multiple sites under the same domain. Um, how we did that through an external authentication provider. Uh, we used Genrain. Uh, and then as we get towards the end, we'll start talking about some other nuances of that project. Um, PS, uh, which is storing PII as a service in an API. Um, Talk about some of the pain points that we had in, uh, in this process as well, uh, particularly proxying web service calls, don't do that. Um, and then how we delegated OAuth tokens in that process. Yeah, and, and we're gonna kind of go through all the basics about um, sessions, how sessions work, um, you know, and the different kind of, these different nuances that will help you um, to ultimately scale to handle some, you know, interesting um, user traffic patterns. So if you don't, if you're not like the greatest expert on user sessions, that's totally okay. We got you covered. Yeah. Cool. Um, so introducing wholeofmarket.com. Uh, whole, right now, um, wholeofmarket.com is primarily a Drupal 7 website. Uh, it launched in July 2000, sorry, 2012. Um, and it was based around a much more static world. The, the overriding goals of that project were to build out um, a highly localized experience, the idea being that every store could have a unique sort of flavor, um, trying to represent the way that each of our stores is slightly different. Um, but we didn't have quite the technology back then, six years ago, for um, doing this highly personalized events based on users. Um, so this is more controlled at the front end. And so because of that, we weren't really focused on, um, on a lot of authenticated experience back then. We did have the ability for users to log in, but the, um, the value proposition for that was, was more on the nuance level. Um, you, you could sign in and store a recipe box, for example, or maybe make a shopping list. But these weren't really primary functions of the website. Um, so as we're building this out, really everything was based around uh, you know, full page refreshes. It wasn't service-based. Um, it, was it was a brochure website on steroids, right? Uh, and so, on that first year of launch, we had a lot of problems with scaling that, um, just even at the static level. Uh, on any given day, we may or may not have had the, um, the capacity to stay up. Um, <laughs> and so it was, um, you know, it took a while uh, and a lot of help from Aqua to get that under control and tame that beast. Um, and that's where we've been kind of coasting for the last four years is, is trying to keep this, um, 
sort of, uh, I don't want to call it antiquated technology, but this sort of, you know, uh, crazy build up and running. Hey, I, I, uh, I see a whole bunch of people in the back. Um, if there are people, if people can move in towards the walls and make some room for the folks in the back so they can sit down, that would be awesome of you. Thanks so much. Hate to see people just like, you know, with no place to go. So please, come in. <laughs> we, we will defrag the, uh, the room. <laughs> nice. Somewhere I'm gonna burn for that one. Running optimized room, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Um, yeah, so D7, um, as we mentioned, had a lot of different issues. Um, we had some very, very primitive Jan Rain um, social integration. So we were using um, Jan Rain to authenticate users. Um, they provide some really great social API tools, um, but our integration wasn't um, really well thought out. So um, it was extremely heavy on the pages. Um, the, the libraries we were using were quite heavy. They were contributing to page bloat. Um, they were slowing things down. Um, it just it wasn't thought out the right way. Um, our DBs um, w became extremely bloated. Um, one of the problems that we had was because we were doing things um, in kind of this organic way, we were also using kind of the most off-the-shelf approaches in Drupal. Um, every time that someone created an account using Janrain, it also created a user record in our Drupal database. So if, let's say, we had a million customers creating accounts, we had a million users in our Drupal database. Um, and it wasn't necessary. We weren't actually really doing anything with that data in Drupal, ironically enough. We were using that data. Um, they were, we were getting them logged in. And then we were basically making calls to some other service to store some recipe stuff or other information. So we had all this PII that was a huge risk um, that we didn't need. So we're, we're making this dangerous storage that, and incurring this risk and cost, and there was no purpose to it. Um, and then, as we mentioned, these, these authenticated experiences were requiring um, full page loads, so we couldn't leverage cache. So um, he mentioned how like the site would go down um, because we weren't using reverse proxies properly, we weren't using a CDN, um, you know, and on a side of that magnitude, it just, it doesn't work, it doesn't scale, you have to, you have to think about these things. You have to think about how do I cache as much as humanly possible. Um, so we had some issues. And, you know, to, to give a sense of scale on that, wholebitsmarket.com gets about a half million visitors a day, and that can swell up and down during the holidays, but that's, that's roughly the size we're talking about, which is a, a big website. But not in the scheme of things. People do much, much larger traffic patterns um, and, and serve those things well. So just to give you a sense of where, uh, at what levels we were falling down. Um, so you want your food to be grown organically, but not your website. So yeah, I mean, you know, and, and this is something that we all have problems with. You start out with something really simple. You start bolting things on. Um, you know, you're all under a time crunch. It happens to all of us. And you know, you get something out, and then you never get time to come back and do it right. Or, you know, so sometimes if you don't do it right in the first place, you're stuck with it for a very long time. Um, and so as we went through several iterations of planning around how we're going to fix this, uh, you know, as I mentioned, those first couple of years were a patchwork of just trying to get big brains in the room um, to give us some guidance on how to tame the beast. Um, so a couple of years ago, we started going a different direction and thinking, you know, what can, we, what can we build out as a fresh experience? And we had a brief and dark foray into a Sitecore build, um, which lasted about a year. And we were going about that in a big bang fashion. And one of the lessons we learned from that process was that um, we had our own institutional issues on planning uh, and how to figure out how we're going to do uh, large scale uh, full spectrum web deployments. And so when we backed out of that process and decided, hey, we still have this Drupal 7 site we'd like to fix up, uh, we doubled down on saying, okay, well, let's get to Drupal 8, but instead of going at it with a big bang, new build, fresh start fashion, let's see how we can nuance that and have a parallel track of development. Um, so we're upgrading certain things. Um, so from the DA perspective, we knew what our high level goals were. We still had a basic North Star idea of where we were heading. And I'm not going to go into all those details, but the big takeaway for this talk is that the, um, there was a, a much, much greater emphasis on authenticated experience. We really wanted to target, um, to give targeted personal 
individual eyes offers to customers um, on a one-by-one -one basis. And we had uh, back-end systems that could serve this out, but the web stack that we had would never be able to handle that kind of traffic. So um, from that standpoint, we're, uh, we were looking at supporting 10% authenticated traffic, which is probably about 40x where we were uh, prior to that. Um, so that was, our, that was our target metric for that. Um, so it's a significant burst there. Uh, because we're splitting the stack up into Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, we needed to have some ability for people to authenticate in one place um, and not give them the jarring experience of having to bounce back and forth and have two separate logins. Um, personalized digital experience uh, extended beyond just the coupons. We also wanted to make sure that they're getting some um, unique value beyond the offers uh, in that experience. And then uh, mobile responsive was a big <coughs> facet as well because our, our current experience was, was very static. And also, um, you know, we had a, um, we had, I think we were running three or four different themes on the site. We had an old fashioned MDOT site. We had a, um, a desktop theme. Um, it was really, really difficult to test and, um, you know, regressions came up um, and it was difficult to scale those things and also make sure that we were then caching both the MDOT and the desktop properly and we had to then double the things that we were caching, which also was unpleasant. <laughs> um, so uh, back to the basics. Um, so we're gonna shift now into talking about uh, just scaling traffic in general um, and, and what the pain points are around authentication. Um, so scaling anonymous traffic is easy. I think uh, most people in the room are probably familiar with that. Um, we, can use CD, we can leverage CDNs to do the heavy lifting, get people closer to the edge, try to cut down the latency. Um, we've got varnish to lean on. Um, you know, so caching is the quick, quick show of hands. How many people here have worked with um, Akamai? Okay, how many people have worked with Cloudflare? Okay, and how many people have worked with Fastly? Okay, so, so we have um, a lot of people um, who are raised their hands for one of those. Um, so there's a lot of experience in this room with, um, with CDNs. This isn't, you know, cutting edge. This isn't, you know, insane to people. You're doing it, um, you know, basically, you know, and for those who didn't raise your hands, um, you know, what the way it works is, you know, you, a request is made, um, it, the CDN provides a caching layer. It says, do I have this? And is it recently valid? If it is, it serves a request. The request never makes it back to the servers um, and your webs are happy. Um, so that could be with um, the CDN. Oftentimes people also throw varnish into the mix as an intermediate layer, um, you know, but they hit the origin, they then store the information inside their caches for the next person. So the next time someone comes along, it's warmed up for them. And in the modern web, you know, a lot of these things end up being served out as basically a static page. And if we want to do personalization, that's something we can handle client side or, or otherwise. So, so these things can get very performant um, at that level. When we get to sessions, though, um, that's a different beast. And yeah. So, so, you know, HTTP is, is a sessionless protocol. So sometimes it take, it's important to take a step back and just say, what the heck is a session? How does this work? So by default, you send a request to HTTP. It doesn't have any idea about who you are, what you are. Um, it just says, OK, it's a request. I'm going to service it. Um, so we have to overlay this concept of a session. Um, and there are some interesting implications of that. So what is a session? Um, so it is like this, those sequence of interactions between a specific person and the server. Um, so you, know, you add something to a card. Well, you, we want to make sure that you know, it's added to your card and not to you, you know, someone else's card. Or if you enter your credit card information, it's, you know, it's yours and it's not mixed up with someone else's. Um, and when we start to deal with caching, where we are, you know, storing things for everyone, we need to make sure that we don't mix it up. Um, so those two can kind of hit each other a little bit. So what does a PHP session look like? Um, you know, we have this um, session super global. Um, often um, it starts with a session start early in your PHP script. Um, Drupal wraps this up and it, it stores all that data across those requests in the DB. Um, so a lot of that is, is handled at a pretty low level of the bootstrap. Um, and it then uses a cookie value to ID you. So there's some sort of a GUID. It's stored in a random cookie. Um, so what does it look like? So um, you know, typically what you'll see is with, a, with Drupal, you'll see these um, cookies that start with a, um, an SESS, um, and then they have a value. What is the value? Eh, it doesn't really matter. It's just a, a random identifier for you. 
Um, and you can see these, you know, really, really easily in your browser. Um, so it's something to, you know, that can be useful to poke at. But we kind of mentioned sessions can be problematic. So why are they a problem? So, oops, oops, oh, uh, hot corner. Hot corner. Isn't she cute? <laughs> Um, so this is a, um, a curl of an HTTP request. Um, typically what happens is we want to make sure, again, that we don't mix, you know, the um, different user sessions. So when, when most CDNs or varnish um, caching layers do encounter a session cookie as part of your HTTP request, they will um, respond with a no cache response. So they will make sure um, that um, everything is bypassed, that um, you know, what you get is unique to you, and it takes a bit of an aggressive stance to make sure that things aren't being mixed. Um, and this is really, really good from a security perspective. It, it's simple, it's easy, we have a clear cut set of rules that keeps everyone somewhat unique. But the sad part is that on this X cache line, we see lots of misses. We don't wanna see misses, we wanna see hits. So yeah, we're under a lot of pressure here. So we've got um, two, some conflicting requirements here that are really, really tricky to address. So we've got these new experiences that want high degrees of personalization, but our infrastructure sucks at it. So, you know, it, it, it makes things tricky. Um, we can, you know, maybe throw lots and lots of servers at it, um, be expensive, probably burn a lot of, um, you know, cycles. I guess we could put some Bitcoin miners on them while they're idle. Um, you know, do something with it with it when we, we aren't using them. But um, we can't cache it. Um, so we have to come up with some other clever ideas to figure things out. And, oh yeah, we need to also figure out how to make this work with D7 and D8 because we're not doing this in a shotgun. We're doing it slowly, gradually. Um, so users are gonna log in on one site and then they're going to move over and manage their recipes on another site. Um, so it makes things really interesting. So um, in order to do that, we're gonna figure out some way to set a token that both sites can somehow read and do something with. So, solutions. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're good at, um, at crushing you, um, but let's, let's try to do something constructive now. Um, so with traditional authentication, um, here's how it works. You, um, you have a user. Um, Look, they're still happy. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep them that way. It doesn't always happen. Um, they hit some sort of an identity provider. Um, maybe it's um, Drupal traditionally. Um, it'll, you know, they'll send their username and password over SSL. Um, it looks, it says, yeah, they're cool. Um, they're great, whatever. Um, and then what it will do is, um, you know, Drupal will um, go and query a session table to get any um, data associated with that session. Um, so it's typically hitting MySQL. Um, it will return that data, um, and then it will manipulate that a little bit and send some personalized data back to that user. That's our traditional model overall. The way that sessionless authentication works is we break this up a little bit. Um, so first, um, from the browser, we hit, um, we go through an, an identity provider. So in our case, we weren't using Drupal. We were using um, JanRain. So JanRain provided this great abstraction layer for us where um, our users could authenticate using, um, I think it was Facebook and Google yeah. um, as their providers. Um, we had some legacy systems, but those were the, the new ones that we were allowing for new registration. As well as traditional user password combinations. Yeah, um, so they, they also allow that as well. So we didn't have to be in the business of managing that inside our Drupal database. Our Drupal database could focus on other stuff. Um, what we would get back a token from this identity provider saying that they have authenticated and they are indeed who they say they are. Um, so then Drupal, instead of going and querying um, MySQL for that session information, it would take those various IDs that we would get from this um, identity provider. So um, their you know, unique ID information, their um, email address, some of those basic things that we needed to interact with them. It would take that information, bundle it up, um, and put it into an array, and then encrypt that array and send it back as a cookie. And that is actually the crux of what we're talking about today, is basically getting rid of that database call and instead 
delegating that to the user um, itself on the browser so we don't have to deal with that. Um, there's a little bit of hand waving here and we'll, we'll call it out. Um, but, but that's the core idea. Um, Drupal doesn't really have any concept of the user. They are not a Drupal user. There are implications for that. Um, and you're gonna have questions about that too. Um, so th there are definitely some limitations in this approach. Um, and some of you are gonna see it, some of you will ask about it. Um, I expect nothing less. Um, so then what happens is, let's say that um, I want to store some dietary preferences. Um, so I send that um, API call with those dietary preference changes. Um, along with my encrypted cookie. Drupal then has a way to decrypt the cookie and decide, is this a valid session? So it decrypts it, it says, first off, does it decrypt? Do, does it look right? Does the data seem well formed? If it, that happens, it then will um, send the data along to a, um, a personalization API that we had. Um, it would write the data um, and then it would respond back um, that, yep, we have updated your dietary preferences, um, and update the, um, the page. So this is the general model that we have. So from Drupal's point of view, um, what happens here is it gets a request with this encrypted cookie. It first says, like I said, does it decrypt? If it doesn't, we just 403 the request. You are not authenticated, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200, sorry. Um, if it does decrypt, properly, then we say is, we put a timestamp in that cookie as well. So typically with a session, a session has a duration. So we're able to encode that along with the rest of that encrypted information. So we say is the timestamp valid? Um, if it's not, again, we forward through the, the request, it's not valid, sorry. Um, if it is, then you are now authenticated, we know who you are, you do have a valid session, and you can move along. So what is in it, this exactly? So magic. anything, it, yeah, it's, it's magic. magic. Pure magic. <laughs> um, so it's anything that might live in the PHP session or user table. So whatever you can imagine, you can shove in this encrypted cookie and send it over to them so that way you're not storing it in your database. Um, so in our case, um, we were using, I think, um, mostly API user IDs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly. Um, um, that expiration time is in there. Um, it was pretty lightweight, though. It was pretty light, yeah. I mean, this is really, a for us, the proof of concept of what we could do to scale. And we had big plans, but what we will eventually shove in there. But, um, you know, really it's anything, it, it is the magic. It's anything that you need to have to be able to serve that experience out can go into this thing. And in our case, we were using this external personalization API. So we didn't need to store the actual preferences themselves. We could just send that along to that. But if we didn't have that API, we could have stored it there and just, you know, let it get stored on the client side if we wanted potentially, or if we absolutely had to, we could still store that in a Drupal table somewhere. Uh, we, we have those, those different options available to us. So how does this let me do D7 and D8? Um, so assuming that the two sites are on the same domain or subdomain, then both sites can read this cookie. Um, and as long as they both know how to decrypt it, they can both read it no problem. So they both get the same uh, key, they both have the same keyhole, you turn the key and you're in. So um, the way that we implemented this was um, we built this on D8, so we built our um, you know, authentication system over there. You would Anytime you tried to log in on D7, it would actually kick you over to D8 um, and you would log in and then you would get bounced back to your original page on D7 to complete whatever action you wanted, like changing those dietary preferences or adding a recipe favorite. So there was, there was code on, yeah, 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 yeah please. Yeah, uh, can go you to, go uh, to the mic, please. I'm just wondering about uh, multiple devices. Uh, obviously, if they do this at work and they go home at night, no cookie, and Correct. on their phone, no cookie. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? They would have to log in again. I mean, just like any other device, um, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna log in, um, but once you're logged in, it would behave exactly the same way. But no dietary preferences. So in this, oh, well, yeah. I mean, in this case, we have the um, that's abstracted out into a uh, an internal service that we have. Um, we call it UPM. It's Universal Profile Manager, um, and that's what is attached to your what we call a UPM ID. But this is like your personal user ID. So if you're using a mobile a native mobile app, it's attached to that ID. 
Um, and then as well as your login as well, because we use a unique identifier by email address. And so we know who you are, we know that you share that ID, and anywhere that you authenticate will call out to that service to grab what it needs about you. And you know, hey, you're a vegan and you live in Seattle or whatever, right? Um, and pass that back. In terms of logging in though, yeah, it's, it's per, per device. So just because you're authenticated in your native mobile app doesn't mean you will be also on your you know, uh, web uh, mobile app or your, or your, web, your web mobile experience. And, and you really, I, I think that, that's a great point. You really only, in this case, want, unless you have that microservice, um, or even when you have that microservice, you want to make sure that you are storing ephemeral data in this. So think of it like a memcache, where you're not storing permanent data there. You're storing stuff that can be destroyed at any point and can be recreated. So in this case, we are storing your basic authentication credentials, you know, um, some stuff that we can get every time that we authenticate you. We're not storing things that we can't recreate. Um, if we did, then to your point, th we would, those would be lost when we destroy the cookies, and that seems like a shame. And speaking of destroying cookies. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we need to. Oh yeah, you have another question. Um, you have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can repeat the question for you, that's fine. So Okay, so the question was, since we're not storing uh, data in the user table, um, as these users come in, does Drupal see them as anonymous users? And the answer is, is yes, qualified. <laughs> yeah, so there, there are two ways that you can do this. One is you can tie into the Drupal authentication system and you can treat them as, assuming that, that the request comes through and that um, you know, they, they pass all of our um, gates, we can treat them as, we can assign them to a role um, and treat them as kind of a, a user of a certain class. Um, they're not an individual user from Drupal's point of view, but we can do that. We can also just simply treat them as an anonymous user, depending on how we're working. Yeah? Does it go into the auth map table? Does it go into the auth map table? Yeah. We, can, we, we could potentially yeah. do that in general. We're avoiding that because then we start to get into different um, database API calls. In our case, <laughs> We had a very, very narrow use case. So by doing this approach, we, we actually don't make any database calls. That's the value proposition for us. It lets us scale very much. If you start um, you know, making all those database calls, then you negate the benefit of this approach, other than the, the fact that you could potentially share the cookie between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Um, so you have to balance that. So you are making some sacrifices in order to um, avoid the database calls, um, and to um, be able to move between the sites. Yeah, I think that the takeaway is that it's a choice that you can make with this approach. So you could, in theory, go the route where you're doing some hybrid of authentication and anonymous as far as Drupal is concerned, um, depending on what your use case is. And that's, that's going to be up to you to handle um, the, you know, the, the pros and cons of that approach. And I mean, and to that point, I mean, you know, and it's kind of where the slide is going. I mean, you know, when we did have a, a, a session in Drupal, we could log them out. So like, let's say that we, um, there's a Drupal, um, there's a vulnerability that attacks the, the password table. Um, I feel like there was something a few years back where we actually actively logged out, we had to log out all users. Doing that's really, really easy. Um, you go, you truncate the, the session table, boom. Everyone's kicked out, go log in again. I think it had to do actually with a, um, there was a vulnerability in um, SSL. Yeah. Um, Hardly. Yeah, Hardly. Yes, yeah, so that was yeah, it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. So in the case of Heartbleed, um, you know, we just we couldn't trust that the um, these SSL sessions were, were valid. We didn't know if user accounts had been compromised, so we needed to log everyone out in a hurry. Yeah. Um, and now that we have this kind of decentralized approach, what the heck are we going to do? So um, so yeah so you know we we can get rid of these zombie <laughs> sessions. <laughs> Um, do you want to walk sure, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, you, you can look at the table here, but the, the gist is that, um, you know, at the top you look at our normal flow, Joe signs in, um, we set a cookie, we talked about storing timestamps in those cookies so that we can set our own parameters around when they expire, uh, looks like 30 days in this case. Um, and then you're off to the races, uh, as Happy Walrus says. Um, so in, this, in the scenario that Adam's describing is like, you know, what do you do when you need to say, get off my lawn, right? 
Um, so we've got this cookie set for September. It's expiring in October. Um, and then we flush them out and then Saul logs back in and he's good to go for another 30 days, right? So mechanically, um, how that's going to work, well, it's not really on the table, is it? Uh, we're, sorry, we're missing a slide here, but the, uh, you know, mechanically how that's gonna work is like we've had code on the back end that, um, uh, I'm gonna let you actually handle that one. <laughs> yeah, <'cause, laughs> <It's okay. laughs> we're um, getting a little, a little heavy there, but the, um, basically it's gonna kill all the cookies off. Um. So, so what we do is we actually store a timestamp um, on the server that says, okay, if anyone um, has logged in um, you know, before this time, um, or if, the, if their expiration is before this time plus 30 days, kick, um, if it was before that, kick them out. If it's after that, they're now valid. Um, so we're able to kind of have this global identifier to say it's okay, um, and, and that goes into that authentication um, flow diagram that we showed you before. Now, the messy part though is we need to make sure that we we hit that button or make that timestamp on all the servers that are doing this. So if we're doing it on Drupal 8, we also need to make sure we do it on Drupal 7. Um, otherwise, it won't work. So by having that one little global value and the timestamp in the cookie, we're able to make sure that people you know are relatively new. So we're basically taking advantage of the check that we already do um, to manipulate that and kick them off. Uh, and P.S. Um, so, storing P personalized, personal, personally identifiable information, um, storing that as a service in an API. I went into that briefly a minute ago with our, our UPM, our Universal Profile Manager, and this is our attempt at Whole Foods to uh, abstract some of that outside of our web accessible properties. Um, so the way that that works uh, on our end is, you know, that can store things like dietary preferences, it can store your email address. Um, uh, in the past, we have stored things like your date of birth. Um, I don't know if we're still doing that, but um, you know, whatever, whatever really um, you want to share across properties, that's the goal that we're trying to solve with this. But it has the added benefit of taking that PII out of the um, sort of the hackable domains, right? And so, in, in our case, Drupal is a consumer of that API, just like any other service. And so, you know, almost anything in the company can hit that through a private API, um, but it's not hitting. From Drupal's perspective, any database calls, we don't store that information, we don't want that information. And so we've got a really clear separation of concerns on that front. And I mean, from a security and compliance perspective, this is really, really big. Um, Drupal's awesome, but it would be very, very easy for someone to accidentally create a view that maybe shows users and maybe put, forget to put like views permissions on it. Um, and all of a sudden, with the best of intentions, maybe someone created an admin page um, they might have actually um, accidentally opened up a vulnerability that exposes all your customer's PII. Yeah. And we get access bypass issues all the time, right? I, I think there was one last week. Um, <laughs> you might have heard of it. Uh, you know, so the, in the normal course of events, I, I think it's becoming bad practice in general to store these things in your database. Um, so this is part of the process of, of ripping that out that I think we're all kind of feeling the pain on right now. And you know, it, in this case, it's a black box API. You could imagine it as another Drupal site potentially. Um, you know, there are really some great um, you know web service um, you know API first approaches in D8. Um, but often, it's a good idea to separate your personalized information from your main web stack. Um, there's obviously some overhead, but it's generally worth that. Um, and the other thing is that um, you know it also allows you through that separation of concerns to load test things much more effectively. Yeah. Um, you know, we mentioned personalization is really, really hard. Um, well, if we can make all of that simply, you know, a single monolithic API that we can hit, we can, you know, slam it really, really hard. We know what the tolerances are, um, you know, and then we can attack those problems, which are a little bit different than the problems of building a brochure site. So we'll talk for about another 10 minutes um, just on some of the problems that we face, or really the biggest problems that we face in that. Um, and then that should leave us 15 minutes for questions after. Um, so uh, the, the biggest one is, is proxying those web service calls. Um, I think that's the road that we went down at first, and it turned out to be uh, um, a mistake in some ways. And I'm going to let Adam go into the details on that. But um, from a performance and stability perspective, I think it was um, a, a big lesson learned. Yeah, so we were working with this API. Um, you know, it was black box to us. There were limits in what we could get from it. Um, and 
you know, we, we had to work around those. So in our case, we had to um, get users authenticated. They would then t take it an action. And then what they would do is, you know, Drupal would then make the call to the to the service and then get a response back and then respond to the user. Um, so a lot of bouncing. Why is this bad? Well, all those hops are adding a lot of latency, so it's slowing down our user experience. Um, you know, we have intermediaries. Um, that's not ideal. Um, your web servers kind of suck. Um, and it, I don't care who you are or what your web servers are, just web servers are finite resources. And every single time you want to make one of these hops through your web server, you have a finite amount of memory, which means you have a finite number of concurrent PHP processes that you can run on your web servers. So every time that you make one of these um, hops, you're, you're basically taking one of those procs out of rotation and you're making it wait um, until this other call finishes. And HTTP calls take a lot of time. So this limits how many transactions per second you can do on your servers, which means now you have to throw more hardware at the problem in order to handle it. And since we're specifically having a project goal of scaling up traffic and scaling up authenticated traffic, um, this was a big issue for us. So what do we do to fix it? So in the model that we just discussed, um, you know, let's say Wally, um, he's asking for some dietary preferences, he goes to Drupal, Drupal goes to the API, API goes to some storage somewhere to get the PII. It goes, um, you know, ideally what we want is, you know, once it gets authenticated, it'll go back to Drupal, Drupal goes back to Wally. Not ideal, hops, hops are bad. What we want is, ideally we want the browser to be able to hit this API directly and bypass Drupal altogether. Drupal has no benefit in this model right now. So in order to do that though, we need something like OAuth where we can delegate um, and create a token that the user can use to um, access this API directly. So what we would do is we would have Wally go talk to Drupal, Drupal would talk to OAuth, get a token back for this API that they can use that um, limits their access, that um, has access controls in place. It would then um, go back to Drupal. It, Wally has this token now and with this token, Wally can then make requests directly to the API. They are safe, they are secure, they're firewalled to the things that only he has access to ideally. This would be great. Unfortunately, we didn't have this. Um, we begged for it, we wanted it, uh, but we couldn't get it. So that's why we were stuck, um, unfortunately, um, with the, the first approach where we did have to proxy through Drupal um, and we did scale up our hardware a bit to compensate for that. Um, you know, it's something that we are still working on, that we do want, um, but, you know, there are trade-offs. Um, and ultimately, you have to deal with the reality of, you know, resources and other teams. I love giving a talk at a Drupal conference about a Drupal site, and the entire gist of it is bypass Drupal. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so ideally, if the browser can access that API layer directly without the inter intermediary, then we're winning. Now, some of you guys may ask about like how does all of this scale? We've talked about performance, we've talked about scalability. Um, so we ran some performance tests. Um, and one of the things that was really, really interesting was as we started to slam all of these authenticated experiences over at Drupal, we saw our CPUs um, spike. Um, and that makes sense based on kind of the story that we just told. Um, you know, the, um, the procs and the CPU are waiting on web service calls um, and, and that's kind of the, the behavior that we would expect. The other thing though that was interesting was our memory was quite low, um, as well as some other um, benchmarks. So, I mean, our CPU is, it, we're busy waiting for these things, but we're not really, we're not spiking our CPU, our memory. Um, so this starts to suggest different trends on how we can scale um, if we're CPU bound. Being CPU bound is a good thing actually in this case. Um, you know, and the other thing that was interesting is if you look um, at our database, um, our database is cold. We're not doing anything. We have almost no database access for any of this. Um, and the database is the part that's really painful to scale. Um, that's the part that we don't want to get into because we have to basically just throw one big piece of hardware to handle the whole thing. Um, it's horrible to do. We don't like doing it. 
So um, the fact that we have these lines that are pretty much steady says, it tells a story, um, which is that we can scale linearly with this approach by webs um, and not have to worry about scaling our database. Webs are cheap and easy to scale. We can throw webs into rotation behind a load balancer. That's simple, it, you know, we don't really have to worry too much. We don't have to have any downtime. Um, we can put them in, we can take them out. It's great for scalability. Um, and the fact that we don't have to worry about our databases or memcache or other things um, is also a huge, huge win for us in terms of scalability. So at the end of the day, we ended up with something that actually scaled pretty well. It wasn't perfect. Um, we worked around those limitations that we did have. Um, we got that separation of concerns. And now each part of our stack can focus on its single concern, its single responsibility, and it can do it well. So we have the API, which we've load tested independently. We know how much traffic we can throw at it, how many transactions per second we can throw at it. We know what our web layer is doing. Um, and you know, we've, we've controlled what everyone is doing. We've done security audits on each layer. Um, so you know, we're not trying to redo every single test, every analysis at every single point. Um, you know, and ultimately, um, it worked pretty well. We, um, since we introduced it, um, we haven't really had to scale up the hardware at all. It's been really quiet, um, and it's been servicing a lot of traffic. Um, and it's been much more robust and had a much better launch than our original Drupal 7 code base Far had. better, yeah. Uh, I wasn't around for that one, yeah. but. Um, I was, it was painful. <laughs> <laughs> um, th this one's been relatively quiet and boring. Yeah. Um, so uh, th yeah, that's what we're going for. Um, so I think that's all that we have. Yeah, that's it. Um, so we've, we've left about a um, little more than 15 minutes for questions. Um, and yeah, we could, yeah, yeah, come on. Can, if you can, please step to the mic. Um, if you can't, I'll try to repeat it for you. I'm looking at this from a cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. of the amount of effort that you put into this, uh, given the fact that it's supporting a site that's on 24-7 with that many users. Um, would you, I don't know, the, the question is, how long did it take for you to go through this exercise and come up with this, this solution? I've got a similar situation where we've got, you know, thousands of authenticated users coming on um, at, at one time, and this approach would really, really be beneficial. But it happens twice a year for only one hour per time. <laughs> So I'm not sure if I want to spend, you know, a whole year of, of, a, of a development effort for two hours out of the year. I'm, I'm going to take the first part of that, if you don't mind. Yeah. And then, Thank um, you. Yeah, and uh, if you want to jump yeah, yeah. in a bit too. But the, um, you know, from our perspective, and I, I, let's rewind that. I think from what I'm hearing from your perspective is that there's two hours out of a year that are affected by this, but those are two very critical hours. <laughs> Um, so from our perspective, uh, our expectations around uh, our marketing campaigns that were targeting certain dates and how we're advertising this uh, were expected to bring in so much traffic all at once that it would have been disastrous if we were to have downtime at those moments. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of effort you can put into front loading that in terms of stress testing and load testing and everything else and trying to figure out where, where your pain points are. But it's a different ballgame really always when you get out of the synthetic game. So for us, there was a huge, there's a lot of dollars riding on getting it right. And um, compared to the technical investments, you know, we were, this was really so central in our case to the, um, the problems that we were trying to solve that it was, you know, it, it added scope and it wasn't wrapped into its own unique beast where we had to invest a ton of hours into it. I think the, I'm gonna let Adam answer that question, but I think that the biggest lift was um, ideating it. More than actually, no. Okay. No, that was that was actually the easiest part, I think. Um, so in this case, we we would have campaigns running throughout the entire year. Um, so I think at that point, that was one business driver that justified the cost of some of that development. Um, if you're doing it once a year, it probably would make more sense to scale up your hardware. Is my gut. Um, in our case, we also had a bunch of additional things that um, that we had to spend money on, no matter what. We had to um, you know, do JanRain integration. We had to be able to log in to multiple um, Drupal instances. So once we, we had those requirements, the sessionless authentication piece was actually fairly minor. Um, it really was, was not a, a heavy lift. And even thinking through it, um, we, hadn't spe we didn't spend that much time mm -hmm. on it. Um, but yeah, in your case, I would probably, I would throw hardware at the problem. I think it's probably cheaper for you. Sometimes that's the answer. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I, I saw that in the brown shirt first, I think. Uh, Okay, so the question was um, a little more detail on the PII API that we discussed, um, whether that was built in-house, and then uh, whether we're experiencing any kind of uh, low-order performance issues on that front. Okay. Um, so the, y yes, the PII API actually does a lot more than just PII, but it's, um, we, we have an internal Whole Foods API that we hit for a lot of these services. This is built and wrapped into that as additional functionality to handle that profile management. Um, and all of that is, um, is, has um, uh, Apogee in front of it as well. And so really the stress on that system is handled by that team internally. It's not necessarily just any database calls on the Drupal side. So on this talk, we're focused just on the, that session handling. Um, but yes, we do introduce load based on the calls that we make to that service. I don't recall that we had particular load issues on that. I think we had programmatic and logic issues, but yeah, so basically, I mean, from our point of view, it's, it's a pure black box. We don't know what it is. We don't really care what it is. Um, what we did do was we worked with that team to make sure that it could handle a certain number of transactions per second. Um, and we, we tried to think through what are some of the worst calls that could potentially happen, aim for those, and then we had that kind of contract with that team to make sure that it worked. Now, you know, what could that look like? Um, it could be a Drupal black box. Um, Drupal does some great stuff there. It could be something powered by a MongoDB, by a DynamoDB. Um, it depends, um, but it's a black box. And as long as you have that kind of contractual agreement with them that they will be able to handle a certain amount of throughput um, and you have those API um, you know, contracts as well, then you'll be fine. Um, yeah, in front, yeah. It's an excellent question. So the question is, how do we handle our admin users uh, in this system? And the answer is, we don't. We, uh, we, have <laughs> we, we abstracted them out into a separate area of the site um, where we replace their existing login page with a different path. Um, and so there's, we, they go to the same domain, but they actually have a standard Drupal login. In our case, um, we're talking about you know, maybe 500 people total. Uh, so the amount of load that our admins put on the system is, is quite low. Um, but, but it's a good call out, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I'm just trying to wrap my head around kind of where the uh, Drupal, the actual Drupal piece of this is that's specific to Drupal. Um, so it sounds like all of the personalization stuff is ideally happening, being kind of rendered on the client side mm -hmm. on top of a kind of static brochureware P Correct. site. Yep. And you're having sending the authentication tokens through to your API pass through, so that's all independent of Drupal, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, are you actually doing anything in Drupal yes. at all, or is it all kind of just stuff on client side stuff on top of Drupal? I mean, in, in, in broad strokes, there, there's a, a custom Drupal 8 module that handles the authentication piece, and so that's what we're taking provide the form, encrypt it, and, and pass it out to where it needs to go. On the Drupal 7 side, there's also code that needs to be able to read that cookie, decrypt it, and, and parse that out to where it needs to go as well. Overall, Drupal really is functioning in this case as a gatekeeper. Um, so it's, it's, it's working with those authentication providers to make sure that you're actually logged in. Once it does that, it really just is uh, the moderator to make sure that you're getting routed to the right place. Um, you know, ideally, once you've gone through authentication, we would love to be able to bypass Drupal um, and go directly to those APIs. Okay, so if you had another OAuth provider, for instance, then Drupal wouldn't even really be in the mix. It would all be client side. It's direct. It would be the same. The I mean, you know, Janrain versus um, you know, I don't know some some other external OAuth system. I mean, really, what we're looking for from them is a thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, and since we're trying to delegate those tokens to the client anyway. I doubt that, we'll, that we would ever want to go fully away, um, mostly because with all the different coordination points that we would need, we probably are going to need an API um, to, to kind of make all those connections for us. And Drupal is really what we see being that coordinator. And then once it makes all those connections 
and sends the data back to the browser, then the browser can go and start to function autonomously. Okay. But that's really our goal. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Pat Miller from Scotts America. We have a very similar kind of history as you guys. We um, yeah. originally had our Drupal site where site users who wanted to do personalized data would get a Drupal login, which caused all kinds of issues. Uh -huh. um, but we're still fighting through some. We've separated our those users to a separate authentication system as well. Uh -huh. But we're still fighting caching issues. I mean, so going back to that prior question, so you are do still have Drupal involved in not only pass the off, but when somebody asks for personalized content, that is still going to to Drupal, and then you're calling the PII system still Correct. from Drupal. Yes. How do you deal with cache? I mean, that makes so many more requests go to Drupal. You don't have load or caching issues. You can't cache anything then. We or can. What so what we've done is we basically, we so for this site, we had about maybe five or six pages overall. Um, everyone got the exact same five or six pages. The place where things were different, where we did um, you know, kind of um, bust based on your session, was um, on all the API calls. So we wrote a, um, a small Vue.js um, application on the client side. So anytime that you did have those personalized pieces of information, Vue.js would um, you know, check, do you have a, a cookie? It can't really tell much about that cookie. Um, it can't decrypt it, um, it, but it can at least um, say, okay, I'm gonna make it, you seem like you're authenticated, I'm going to make a request to get your dietary preferences and then display them. So I'm going to make you know an AJAX call over to the server. Server is going to respond with another call. I can't cache those because they're personalized, as you, as you mentioned. Um, but we found that um, you know they were lightweight enough um, and with the right balance of hardware, we were able to handle that. And the nice part is, I mean, full page renders take time. Uh, we didn't have to do those, so we weren't rendering the pages on a per user basis. Um, so we found that you know because we weren't doing that, we weren't invoking you know all the different um, render layers on a per user basis. We we scaled quite nicely. Yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you mentioned this in the beginning about uh, managing carts. Like com it's, it sounded like you had to deal with some commerce issues, possibly? We actually ha did, didn't for this service. Okay, but, so I was, but, but, I was, but we can, let's pretend we did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I guess I was just wondering, like, if, if you took that out of Drupal, uh -huh. how did you manage, you know, the, how would you manage the card in this in this case? And it sounds like you didn't have that problem, so. But, 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 but we, we, can, we, we can may imagine. eventually have had that problem, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we would handle it just like any other um, you know, this, this PII as a service. It would be another API endpoint to us. Um, so just like we have uh, this PII, um, you know, service, we would have our cart um, API, and we would proxy those calls. Ideally, we wouldn't be proxying. We would, you know, get a token and then go direct. Right, I guess, and then I think those are some of the implications that you have going this route. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, Drupal Commerce can manage that stuff for you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like the card on file module. There's a lot of that stuff that's baked into Drupal Commerce that right. I guess you would lose with this approach. Absolutely. That you would have to go and build like a custom solution for is basically what you're saying. Right, and it depends on, you know, which, what, what's right for you. Um, in our case, you know, we, we were not, do, we didn't have any plans to do anything with that date, with the user data inside Drupal as a, as a Drupal user. That it was mostly a liability in our case. There are other use cases where it would be far more useful. Um, and in those cases, this might not be the right solution because you do lose the richness of that Drupal ecosystem. Right, right. So definitely with like, you know, if, if you're a Drupal commerce user, then this is probably not the right approach. Right, okay. I just want to make sure that that wasn't a piece of this. Nope, so. nope, All right, nope, cool, totally. thank you. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering how and when do you update cookie exploration timestamp? Only, so we do it when someone logs in. We, we set that, that um, timestamp. Um, eventually, it will expire and they'll get kicked out and they'll log in again um, and they'll get an updated cookie with a new timestamp. Um, otherwise, um, you know, the only other time that it becomes an issue is when we have like a heart bleed scenario like we mentioned right. where we need to kick everyone out we set the global value, and then the authentication system says, okay, you're not valid, I'm gonna 403 you, and then in that case, they re-authenticate. Oh, okay. So if I'm logged in today, and my uh, cookie expired a month from today, um, if I am on the site like a second before the expiration, it would just automatically log me out then? Correct. Okay, yep. thank you. Um, 
Had it been just a D8 only site, would you have considered using the big pipe module for personalized information on the site? We had, it definitely was something I had considered. Um, I don't think we would have. I think be, mostly because we still wanted to avoid those full page refreshes. Um, we still, that, there still would have been implications with all the different caching layers. Um, and it, the, we, we still would have been doing full page refreshes. Ultimately, I mean, it's, it would make them better, but you know, ultimately, it's you know, Vue.js allowed us to create a much, much more, you know, um, I, I hate to say responsive, but you know, reactive, um, you know, user experience. Um, so they would click something, and then something else would happen. Um, so it was much more dynamic for the end user, which I don't think you're going to get just from Big Pipe. Yeah. So. Um how applicable would a solution like this be to an ecosystem of websites which all share SSO and some of which are very locked down by role so you can't go to a lot of past like 100,000 nodes <laughs> that you only certain people can see? Um, is, does you think this actually would provide a lot of advantage? Because it seems like we still have the same problem like Drupal still has to wake up like you know just get to varnish you know just peel a layer off varnish. And, it depends on what, what exactly they're trying to do with the site. Um, because, I mean, you're still going to, you know, are, are, these are people who all have different <coughs> roles, I'm assuming? Yeah, there are maybe like five roles okay. across a bunch, are, are many, many people. Is it the same roles across the sites? Across uh, yes, they would, they're unified now. So what you could potentially do then is you could, you know, have them log in on a primary site um, and then encode the roles um, you know, roles and any other um, attributes into the cookie, mm -hmm. um, and then they could take that with them. You could tie into some of the authentication systems inside Drupal to then, um, you know, create kind of an ad hoc user for them that, you know, has that role, give them those permissions, um, and but that could work. The only issue that you might have is in some cases when you edit content, you may need an actual, like, database user um, yeah. So what you could, what it could do is it could on the fly just create a user for them to then um, map that data to, like when I, they authenticate. I guess I'm just not seeing where the savings would come in. For that case, there might not be. Um, At least not in the scenarios that that would lean on that user, right? Yeah. I mean, when you, I think where this starts to not work is when you actually need to have a proper user, like a Drupal user itself. Right. Um, so and that's where where this loses its value, I think. Right. So when, on one of our sites, it's just like publicly accessible and getting hello user makes the render 10 times longer, right? Yeah. So th th that's a case where we could clearly change it. But if there are more complicated sites where you have access to forums and things like that. I, don't I, I think once you once you go down the route of creating a row in that user table, or, I think organic you're, groups, you're, you're back to where you are, right? So I mean, right. you haven't gained anything. So I think in your case, the question I would be asking is more of, um, is it, is it acceptable to have a disruption in that user flow to where when they need to get that taken care of, they're asked for additional? Yeah. You know, and then from your standpoint, is that worth is that worth the effort to, to roll it out? But yeah, it, it, it probably isn't. Um, you know, if, if you need the user table, this might not be the right approach. If you don't need the user table, then this is awesome. In our case, we had we had gigs and gigs of users that were just weighing us down like an anchor. Our database right now is like 25 megs. We can drag it between environments. Um, it's awesome. Like it was like six. I mean, like it's it's like Whole Foods is a case study at Acquia about large client databases. It's uh, it, um, <laughs> yeah, and it, it's helped our developer velocity. It's helped. Um, you know, we can just pull the database down. We don't really have to worry about sanitizing too much now because of that. Um, so we're in a much better place than we were. We probably have time for one more quick one, um, and then Adam and I'll say afterwards for another ten minutes if you have any one-on-one -on -one questions. Anyone going once, one twice? Cool. Thank. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys use for the uh, token encryption? Um, Secret sauce. Not yes. telling you. <laughs> Custom. <laughs> Something good. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. For the GDPR stuff, you mean, or just in general, like yeah, in general, uh, you have to get their Yeah, so we we um, we internationalize through external through Fastly, basically. It's, that's doing all the detection, and that's how we know 
you know, you come from the UK, right, we need to change our form to do a phone number prefix and stuff like that. And, and, I, and have additional terms of service and, 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 and all right. those things. Yeah. Yeah. Through, through, fa through Fastly, yeah. 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 So, so um, in order to register, you have to, there are terms and conditions on the page, um, and they are changed for those international yeah. users. So, um, you know, fast, we're using Fastly. They can do the geo detection on the edge. They then, um, you know, add that to um, the HTTP headers. We vary by those HTTP headers, so everyone gets a different version. Um, there are implications for that, but so we, we use that sparingly. We don't want to do that on all pages, yeah. but on the ones that we care about, we do that. Cool. Yeah. Take it easy. Hey. How's it going? Oh, fine. Would, would that be a... <laughs> you, because you've worked with Sakurada and Tim yeah. Holtz, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, nice. Uh, Are you guys trying to build that out in house or are you trying to use like we're leverage Gen Rand for some of that stuff? Uh, we're considering doing it in house and then using Gen Rand just for the API. We did, yeah, we used the API. Um, yeah, the, the, the built in forms and stuff, um, I forget what it's called, um, but they're like form builders, definitely a little, it's a little heavy. Um, so, so, what are the things that um, are challenging you? So, okay, so, yeah. so, you, so you're having jam.